Okay. Uh, are you seeing my screen? Yeah. Okay. All right. Welcome, everyone. Um, so some of you were in our last training about customer service assistance. Uh, welcome back. And for those of you that, uh, that haven't been on one of these, um, we're going to talk about how to build a lead qualification assistant today. So um, hopefully you taken a, a looked a little bit at, at the new assistant framework, but if not, I'm going to give a quick overview. Um, for those of you that were on last time, this one's going to be a little bit different. Um, this, the lead qualification assistant is somewhat more uh, involved than the, than the customer service assistant. So uh, instead of building it live, um, I have one pre-built that we're, we're going to demo and then go over the different components and talk about how it works. So that's the plan. If I can get my mouse over to the right screen. Uh, there we go. Okay. okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. So um, what are AI assistants uh, in Flowxo? They are, uh, it's a brand new feature that was added that, um, that allows you to create autonomous AI driven conversational experiences just using a natural language prompt or description of, of what the uh, what the assistant should do. So uh, you know prior to AI assistance, uh, you would have if you were going to build a conversational experience in Flow XO, you'd do it with a series of workflows that had uh, filters that would branch depending on what answers that your users gave. Uh, so you could send different messages, send them to different paths. Um, and all of that would be built in a very structured way. Uh, but, you know, that was great, but it, it took a lot of time and there was not a whole lot of flexibility to it. For instance, if you design a structured experience like that and your user asks a question that you're, you didn't anticipate, then, you know, the, the bot just isn't going to respond in a reasonable way. Um, so uh, to, to help with that, we've, we've added... Uh, the assistant framework and uh, the way that it works is that you define what you want your assistant to do in just a natural language prompt and you tell it what tools it should have and so tools uh, are just different they can be flows they can be integrations uh, we have a number of built-in tools they're different things that the assistant can do and you don't have to tell the assistant exactly how to use each tool you just need to tell the assistant that the tool is there and you can give it some general background on when it can use it and it will decide when a good time to use that tool is. So for the lead qualification, uh, which in this case, we're going to, uh, we just have a, a simple demo where um, we're going to ask a couple of questions for uh, you know, an imaginary user that might be interested in FlowXO's products. Um, and we're gonna ask them a few questions to decide whether or not we should uh, send them self-help resources or book a call with the sales agent, and uh, if they if they get all the way to the sales agent, we'll actually facilitate. This assistant will facilitate making that appointment, and it'll stick it on the Google Calendar. Um, so, uh, the interesting thing about assistants is that they have uh, they have a number of capabilities that the um, that previous versions of of bots on Flowexo didn't have. Um, namely, they have a a memory of the entire conversation so that they can understand better the context of what's going on. Uh, for instance, if the user asks a follow-up question like, can you tell me more about that? Um, because the assistant knows all the conversation prior, it knows what the user is talking about and can answer that question intelligently. Uh, it can also um, do things like, uh, you know, if, if for in the, our scheduling assistant, for instance, if we presented, presented four or five um, different options of time slots and the user decides, you know, types in one that wasn't available, the assistant can see that that wasn't an option that was presented and won't allow, allow that to happen. Um, so this is the, I don't know how well you can see this, but this is the the workflow that, uh, that this assistant that we're going to look at follows. Um, and this workflow is this is designed as you'll see in just in just natural language prompts, but I've just diagrammed it here so you can see how it's going to flow. So uh, we're going to ask the prospect their name. Uh, we're going to find out why they're here at all, what their main goal is with uh, with our tool, 
And uh, if we can match that to a, a set of predefined, if the AI can match that to a set of predefined use cases, then we'll go on to the next step. If it can't, if the user says something ambiguous, we'll specifically ask them for, for their use case from our list of categories. So letting more people in. And then, um, and then we'll, we'll ask them if they're interested in our services, uh, professional services uh, for development. And if they are not, then we'll thank them and send them to some self-help resources. If they are interested, we're going to ask them for a budget. And if their budget is over, you know, some arbitrary threshold we made up, um, then we're going to we're going to make an appointment with them with this with a sales agent. And if it's under, then we're going to send them the self help resources again. It's a pretty classic uh, lead qualification flow, um, and so we, we'll show you how easy this is to build and flow it. So, all right. Um, so the goal of the assistant is, like I said, collect information about the prospect send them to the right place. Um, and there's various different components that this will be built out of. Uh, the first one obviously is the lead qualification assistant itself, responsible for making first contact with the user, collecting data about the user, and then uh, deciding whether or not the, the prospect should move forward to sales or uh, be sent self-help resources. Um, and then the next component is the scheduling assistant, which is an, an entirely different assistant that we built um, that is responsible for scheduling appointments with sales. And it will be called by the lead qualification assistant when necessary. Um, and then we're also going to show the conversation completed handler, which is how we can take this data that we've captured on the prospects and do something with it, like stick it in a CRM, put it in the Google Sheet, whatever you want, send an email. Um, and then we'll also, if we have time, we'll, we'll go over how we can deploy this uh, to your actual users. All right, so that's the overview. And so uh, what we're gonna do now is do a, we're gonna, we're gonna, before I go into how this is all built, we're just gonna take a look at it in action. Uh, so you can see how it follows that workflow that I showed you. Uh, and also OpenAI is being a little sluggish today, so you have, might have to bear with me. All right, so the first thing uh, the assistant does, it greets, greets the user um, and asks what, we should, what it should call them so that it can address them by their name later. I'm just going to say call me maybe. All right, so nice to meet you. Maybe uh, could you share with me the most important thing you're hoping to achieve within your business using conversational AI? So it's asking an open-ended question and then it's going to make an attempt to categorize that according to our list of categories. Uh, I'm gonna give it a softball for now. Um, I'm gonna say, uh, I want to reduce customer support costs. So it's going to see if it can match that to our set of use cases. Um, and it's also uh, going to give us a little paragraph here about why that's a good idea. So that's a great goal. Maybe conversational AI can significantly reduce your customer support costs, yada, yada. It's giving a little bit of um, a little bit of information about how our solution can help in their specific use case. And then it's going to, it's going to ask about professional services. Would you be interested in getting expert assistance from our professional services team? Yes or no. And so uh, in this case, I'm just gonna say no so we can see the, the simple use case. Don't want professional services. So uh, according to our workflow, it should be sending us to some self-help resources. And it did. So uh, gives a couple of links and uh, more or less ends the conversation. So let's do that again, uh, but let's take a, a couple of different paths so we can see some of the flexibility that these things have. All right, Bob.
All right, nice to meet you, Bob. What are you hoping to achieve? I want to make millions of dollars. All right, so that should not be easily categorizable into our use cases. Uh, all use cases would probably apply to that. So uh, hopefully our assistant is gonna ask for some clarification in this case because it, it wasn't able to, to make a match. Thinking, thinking. New Jeopardy music. Come on, I think I got it. This is an unusually long wait for this particular part of the flow. Demos. All right. I'm going to wait for a little more. It will, it will come back with an answer, but every once in a while, uh, OpenAI gets lost in the weeds. It's only about, it takes like 30, 40 seconds. It doesn't happen that often. Unless they're having an issue. Yes, and can you check their status page? Open AI. Yeah, bonnet. Hmm. All right. Uh, I want to know. Anybody you can do this. All right, so that's a great goal, Bob. Uh, so, so it did uh, determine that it couldn't uh, make a match to one of our use cases. So it presented some options. Just going to choose customer support. And now, um, according to our plan, uh, it should ask us if we're interested in uh, professional services, like it did before. And this time we'll say yes, that we are. Um, so I'd like some help. Now we should be getting a question about our budget. So we, uh, it can decide if, uh, if the prospect is going to go on to sales or not. All right, so fantastic to better understand uh, or to better assist you. We'd like to know your budget range. Uh, we've predefined some budget ranges to make it easier. Uh, we're just gonna pick one over the threshold so that we can move on to the next step. Um, these, I could have just typed in a number as well and it would have figured it out. Uh, all right, so now uh, we are going on to sales. So now we need an email address so we can send a confirmation and contact the user, Bob at FlowXO. And so uh, this is where it's transferring to the, uh, the scheduling assistant. So now uh, the Lead qualification assistant is handed control to a scheduling assistant who needs to know our time zone so it can do scheduling. And uh, it, it's asking for the specific time zone or just the city. I'm just gonna say my city and it can figure it out. You can, of course, also schedule in. All right, so uh, you are in the Pacific time zone. Uh, is that correct? I put this in here because um, uh, it, it was getting this confirmation because it was getting the time zone, the daylight savings time confused. Uh, so it, the AI is pretty good, but it does sometimes need little tricks to make sure it does exactly what you want. Uh, and, that, and that was one of them. So for some reason, if it didn't read back the time zone to the user, it would, it would get the offset wrong. 
from time to time. So with this container, it gets it right pretty much all the time. Uh, all right, and so now uh, it's checking the Google Calendar. It's checking our sales calendar, which uh, this is just a, a mock, this is a made up one, but there's a whole bunch of things on here and it's going to only provide options uh, that are not currently booked. All right, so there it is. So uh, we have a bunch of them on Thursday, a couple on Friday. Uh, I'll just pick one, say 11 a.m. tomorrow. And let's see if that's actually was available. Wait, was it tomorrow? Yeah. All right. All right, and now it's booked. Uh, there it is. And there's the confirmation. And probably, oh, I shut my email down so I didn't get notifications. And then you know, Google Calendar sent, a, sent an email as well. Uh, so I'm gonna, we're gonna show how this happened later, but this lead was just created in the Google Sheet as the email, the use case that it determined uh, their, whatever they typed in for their, their primary goal, budget range, whether or not they want professional services, and then the schedule identifier. Um, so that's, that's the whole thing. Um, you can be, I'm gonna, I'm gonna show one more thing on the scheduling assistant. I'm not gonna go through the entire process again, but I wanna show you how, uh, how flexible the scheduler can be. So uh, I just took the, the happy path, which was to pick, you know, pick a time that it suggested. By the way, uh, because I didn't want to go through the entire lead qualification flow, I just went into the sub assistant. Uh, when you're building a good reason for breaking your solution into multiple assistants, uh, in addition to the fact that the AI just does a lot better when it has only one job to do, is that you can uh, you can completely test uh, and build out uh, the sub assistants on their own, independent of one another, before you connect them together, which saves a whole lot of time. So this time, instead of accepting its um, its suggestions for time slots, I'm going to uh, I'm going to be a little bit trickier. We'll see how it does. So uh, hopefully it's not gonna show us that 11 o'clock time slot anymore because it should be gone if we just took it. All right, yeah, so Thursdays, Thursdays gone. So I'm gonna say something, something different like um, Mondays and Wednesdays after 2 p.m. are good for me. I'm out of the office until this weekend next. All right, so now it's looking for time slots um, on Mondays and Wednesdays after two. Uh, Two weeks from now. So I'm not going to go through this whole thing because you get a, get a sense for how it works, but I am just going to wait for it to come up with the time slot so you can see that it actually is picking. Uh, it should probably be in May by then. All right. Yep. So May 6th uh, through May 8th, suggesting time slots there. So very flexible. Uh, it would be pretty hard to build something like that um, just with workflows. All right, so let's go back to our uh, 
to our lead qualification assistant and let's talk about how this thing is made. Um, so every assistant has, uh, has a number of, of core pieces to it. Um, it has a goal, a persona, instructions, and tools and, and outputs. And so I'm gonna go over each one of those um, briefly uh, one at a time. So the goal is what the assistant is there for. What should it be trying to achieve? This should be a short, simple, very precise sentence about what the outcome uh, the assistant should have. And in this case, we just wanna collect data about our prospect um, and we want to either schedule a call with the sales team or direct them to self-help. Um, when you're composing your goal, if you find that you're trying to put too many things that into the goal that the assistant should be trying to do, that's a good indication that you should be creating a separate assistant uh, and then and then connect them together. So uh, the goal is is sent to the AI. The AI is aware of it, but it's also really important to help you clarify and really focus on a specific purpose for each assistant that you build. Uh, the persona is is who the assistant is, what its name is, if it should have a specific voice. Um, it just is a description of the of who the assistant is trying to present to the world. Um, and in this case, we, we made it real simple. Uh, we're just saying that uh, there's a customer advocate for FlowXO uh, and, and her name is Flo. All right, um, so let's take a look. I'll go into the editor for this part. So let's take a look at the instructions. Um, so the instructions is, this is where the magic happens for the assistant. It's where you tell it everything that it should do. You give it any resources that it needs or as far as like background information. Um, and you can tell it what rules that it should have. Uh, and we have a number of examples in here that we'll talk about. Um, so the first thing that we did in here was just put our self-help resources so that when we ask the assistant later to send self-help resources, it knows what links to send. Um, this is this is overly simple, but it can be you can have all kinds of stuff in here, um, and it's not just links necessarily. You can you know you can create these sort of reference sections uh, in your in your prompt, and then you can refer back to them later, which you'll see that we do. Um, and then uh, and then for a workflow driven assistant, the way that that I like to build these is I I like to give it. Um, a, a specific process to follow. And so uh, the process is just a series of steps that it needs to take to accomplish its goal, plus any alternate paths that it needs to take. So, uh, and then we're pretty literal, liter uh, excuse me, we're pretty literal when writing these. Um, and, and you wanna be clear and as simple as possible. So in this case, we're just telling it to introduce itself and, and Ask what they ask what the AI should call them, and you saw that happen in the in the in the demo. Um, and then we ask the prospect the most important thing they're hoping to achieve. So very very straightforward. Um, and then we also say, uh, if you're unable to determine one of the standard use case options from their response, offer them the choices of the available use cases. So you saw that happen too. What you don't see in here is the list of the available use cases. So I'll show you where that, where those are defined uh, shortly. So then we we ask it to briefly briefly explain how conversational AI is going to help them with their use case, and uh, and then we ask them we tell it to ask if they want professional services, uh, and then this part is important. So we say provide two choices. Uh, I'd like help and no thanks, I've got this. So you saw those that exact text in the buttons that showed up that the user could click. If this wasn't here, the two choices bit, um, sometimes it might have buttons, sometimes it might not have buttons, uh, sometimes uh, it, might not even, it might not even ask the question. Um, so the, uh, or I'm sorry, it'll ask the question in like a free text format that's that's harder to interpret. So anytime you want to put, give your user uh, clickable buttons, uh, you just ask it for choices. That's what it's called inside the inside our our system prompt. And so you want to use the exact word choices, and then it'll usually create buttons for you. 
Um, and so here's our branching. If the prospect is not interested in professional services, send them the help sort self-help resources and thank them for their interest and the conversation. So we saw, you know, we said, send them the help self-help resources. We had this labeled self-help resources that knew where to find that and figured that part out. Um, and then if the user uh, is interested, wait, where I lost my place, sorry. Uh, if the user is interested, then we're gonna ask them for their budget from the predefined options. Again, you don't see those listed here. We've listed those a little bit later um, in the output variables, which I'll show you. Um, and then if they specify a budget below 5,000, send them self-help resources. If it's above 5,000, then ask them for their email address and uh, schedule demo. So you can see that these, you know, this logic, this branching logic is extremely simple to set up uh, using just uh, simple sentences about what you want the bot to do, and then it does it. Um, and so then uh, after the scheduling, so this the scheduler, like I said, is a is a separate assistant. So um, that we created as a tool, and I'll show that in a second. Um, and then after that's done, then we provide them with the event ID um, as a confirmation number, and you, and so that's what happened. Uh, and then we have some rules. Um, so the instructions or the processes is, the, is basically the workflow that the assistant should follow. And the rules uh, you'll develop over time as you're working on your bot to try and influence its behavior. Uh, these, you usually start with a couple obvious ones and then you'll add these as you go along when the bot's doing things, the AI is doing things that you, you wish it wouldn't do or you wish it would do differently. Uh, you can add to your rules here and that'll, with GP. T4, that'll usually correct the problem. Uh, so, uh, you know, we're asking it. I'm not going to go through each one of these. I'll send you guys a template later. You can go over this at your own pace, but you know, we're asking it to only answer ask one question at a time. Um, uh, so some of the ones later on were definitely added from testing. You must write all required fields to the output data. Uh, sometimes it was skipping a field or two, like the email. Um, and then when, when you're asking for user specific data elements, make the name or description of the data bold. So like you saw that when it was asking for email, it bolded the email, it bolded the word budget. That's not in the, that's not in the process anywhere. Um, it just figured that out because of, because those fields were in our output field specification. Uh, and so the user description, so that's it. That's it for instructions for now. The user description is is a description, an optional description of your user to help the AI know who it's talking to. In this case, we tell it it's a pr prospect. It's interacting on our website. And we also uh, give it the language um, using a variable, we, a variable injection, which I'll send a link to that. Um, but you can, anything that's in your, your user's custom attributes or in their profile can be injected in here. So um, the language is on the web anyway, it's de it detected automatically. So if, you know, if, you're in a, if your browser is set to Spanish, the bot should start conversing with you in Spanish because we have this little, uh, this little bit here. Um, and and like, don't, don't try and take notes or anything, we'll, we'll send this to you uh, so you can look at it later. All right, so the default model, uh, I always recommend GPT-4 Turbo. Um, I, I don't know how familiar you, you are with open AI, AI models. There's, there's a fast, cheap one called 3.5 3 Turbo, but it's not nearly as smart. It makes four, it, 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 can, be, it can work on customer service assistants that are just querying a knowledge base and answering questions. Um, it really doesn't work that well for workflow driven things like lead qualification. So you really want to use GPT-4. Um, as, as a bit of trivia, GPT-4 Turbo is now uh, available. You can see the previous preview model. Uh, if you're using that, you should probably switch to the one that doesn't say preview on it. Um, it's, uh, it's the top performing model in the, in the world right now. Um, there was another challenger uh, uh, that uh, Claude that uh, took the top spot away from GPT-4 Turbo for a minute, but they got it back with, with this version. So make sure you're on that one for uh, anything workflow oriented like this. 
Uh, all right. And so the output fields is really important for uh, an assistant like this. Um, because you're gathering data on a prospect. You want to do something with that data. You want to put it in your database. You want to put it in your CRM. You want to be able to send them emails. You want to be able to send them broadcasts, whatever it is. Um, and so the output fields are all the different data points that the AI is trying to collect during the course of a conversation and, uh, and will then make available to automations after the conversation is over. So uh, I added a whole you know, all the ones that were relevant to this type of conversation are in here. We have the name, the email, the budget range, et cetera. Uh, and this is also where the categories came from. So like the budget range, for instance, um, we just gave it a name, gave it a type, uh, a description so the AI knows what it is and how it should be collected. Uh, and then we gave it just a series of options here. So there's all our budget options that we saw presented as, presented as buttons. Uh, similarly, in the use case, uh, those are here's all the options that uh, that we wanted for use cases. You'll notice that we're using sort of a technical format here uh, with underscores for and and that's just because these might very well tie to external systems like a category in your CRM. Um, and even though we put these sort of uglier code-like um, options, you saw that in the demo that the AI translated those into human-friendly format. It didn't. It didn't present the user with uh, with these weird labels. It, it gave it a nice nice label. But behind the scenes, um, the data that came out was was these, which which might need to match to uh, to something downstream in your application. Um, all right, uh, so you can add as many of these as you want. Um, you will usually, in your instructions, need to tell the AI when to gather that particular piece of information, but not always. Um, but, uh, but if you want to use a piece of data later from the conversation, it should go in the output fields. And then the tools, uh, like I mentioned, are the different things that the AI can do, the different uh, capabilities it has, and in this case, uh, we gave it a knowledge base, which I didn't show, but uh, this assistant could answer questions about the business, about your business, um, if the user asks during this process, um, and then the schedule demo tool, which uh, uses a, another sub assistant to do the scheduling work. Let me see time here. Uh, so that's uh, that's really it for the lead qualification assistant. Um, but I am going to go take a look at the uh, at the scheduling assistant as well, real quick. So, because this is also a pretty important piece, I'm not going to go over every part of this uh, because it's a little bit more involved. You will get a template, so you can see it on your own. Um, but I just want to show that uh, that it has it has its own access to certain tools and output variables. So. Um, in this case, the only output that we need from the scheduling assistant is the event ID. And uh, you'll notice that the, um, that the output of the lead qualification assistant also included the event ID, which it got from this assistant. So when, when a sub assistant, such as the scheduling assistant, is done with its work, it'll send any of its output data back to the main one, who can then roll it up into the and sort of aggregate uh, anything, any data collected through various. Um, various tools. And uh, here we have uh, a couple of tools that Dit's using, and I'm actually going to show you two of them. Um, current time, which it needs to sort of be able to do relative dates, like if someone says tomorrow, it needs to know what today is. Um, and then it can also query the Google Calendar for open slots, and it can book, uh, it can book an event or a meeting on the Google Calendar. Um, so let's take a look at some of those tools and, and, uh, and how they're built. All right, so uh, we're using three different, uh, three different flows here, none of which are controlling the conversation. They're all, just, uh, they're all just extra support for your assistants to be able to do more powerful things. So the first one that, it, that the scheduling assistant uses is the query schedule tool. And... Uh, 
And I'll send you, I can also send you a, a document on how to build your own tools so you can see exactly how these are structured, what each piece does. We don't have time to go into that in detail today, but you can just know that you create flows uh, to, do, to do things that the assistant can't do on its own, like look up calendars. Um, and so this, uh, we have a Google Calendar integration. It's this particular aspect of it for getting availability is designed specifically for AI. Um, and so you can pick whatever, whatever calendar you want. Um, the date ranges will come from the assistant. We're gonna have an article on just scheduling to uh, we'll go into more detail on this, but you can see that, um, that this is a variable substitution. So this piece of data comes from the assistant when the query happens, uh, same with the time zone. Uh, and then you can set up all kinds of uh, things. You can say you set your working hours, which which could be that doesn't have to be Monday through Friday. You can make them different for different days of the week. But uh, in any case, you can set your working hours, your lunch hours, uh, the time zone that you're specifying your work hours in, uh, how long the meeting duration is, if there should be a, a buffer in between meetings for preparation. Um, how many results you should come back and then a couple of other uh, a couple of other aspects so um, this is a really powerful tool if you're building any kind of scheduling to be able to uh, to get you know all of the available meetings and avoid any sort of schedule conflicts uh, we also have the book demo so once you pick a time slot um, then it needs to be added to the calendar so our Google Calendar integration also has the ability to add events to the calendar. Um, I'm not gonna go through each of these fields, but you can see here that uh, you can put in a, a like a Zoom link if you, if you want to, that'll get sent to the user when the calendar entry is created. Um, and then more variables that come from the assistant. So the assistant's gonna send the start time, it's gonna send the end time, it's gonna send the attendees, which is the email that we collected. Um, and then you can set uh, a few other uh, things like whether or not to send a reminder email, uh, what calendar it should go on, et cetera. So very simple. Um, in this one, we're also setting a user attribute. Uh, we're putting the, the event ID in the user profile. So uh, later, if you wanted to let the user edit that, you could, you could make your assistant do that with a little bit of extra prompting. Um, and then we set the output. So that's the book demo assistant or a book demo tool. And now I want to talk about um, I want to talk about how we what do we do with this data afterwards? Um, and so let's see here. All right, so that's where the capture lead comes in. So uh, we have an event and let me I'll show you how you would create this, but then I'm going to, I'm not going to do the whole thing. I'm going to go back into one we already built. Um, we have an assistant event trigger type for your flows. And one of those is assistant run completed. That's going to happen every time your assistant is finished with its conversation. Let me just delete this. And so I set one up here. Uh, you can pick which assistant that you want uh, this flow to run for. In this case, we're just, we just did the lead qualification assistant. You can pick any of your assistants, or if you don't pick any, you can have a flow run for all of your assistants. Um, and so what we're doing with this is we're adding, we're taking all the data we collected and we're sticking it in a, in a Google sheet that we set up. Uh, and that is this here. You can see here's all our tests that we did. Uh, and that happened because of this. We just picked this, the sheet and the worksheet, and then we put in the variables that, um, from the data that came out of the assistant. Um, it was pretty simple. Uh, we're also using this uh, to segment the user. So uh, we're we're adding the user to, to a segment based on the uh, the use case that they chose. I can show you that in a second when we look at the user. We're also updating the user's profile with, uh, with their name, their email, and the language that they use. So when, you, when the other assistants interact with them in the future, they'll, they'll already can know this information. You can see 
So here's Bob's test that we did. Uh, we can see that usually when you have a web, a web user, they just have some cryptic ID because we don't know who they are, but, uh, but we, the assistant was able to set their name, um, set their email and their language. You can see we added them to the customer support. Uh, we added them to the customer support segment. So if you wanted to now broadcast, send a broadcast, send a message to everybody that has interacted with uh, your assistant that was interested in customer support, you could really easily do that um, with, with this segment. All right. Uh, there is one more thing before I open it up to questions that I want to look at with you guys, and that is um, the, run log, the run history, the run log. So every time your assistants run, we keep a history. We we keep a history of every message, and then also every tool call, every uh, every response, and um, there's quite a bit of information that's in here, including, for instance, how much uh, that assistant that that interaction cost you in AI costs anyway. Um, and then you can see here's the whole conversation. This is this is the conversation with the scheduling assistant. Um, and if you click on these, they open up and you can see a little bit more information. Uh, for instance, uh, you can see the scratch pad here is what the assistant was thinking. So this is actually really helpful when you're trying to figure out why your assistants are doing what they're doing. Um, so in this case, you can see it's just saying I started the process. First, I need to confirm the, the email address. Uh, so messages, messages, uh, you can see the options that were provided. Um, and then down here, so uh, we, after we confirmed the time zone, then the assistant went and queried for available time slots. So that means it had to call a tool. And we can see that here with this little where bracket, it says query schedule, that's the tool that it called. If you open that up, you can see the actual data that was used to call the tool. This is, you're gonna use this a lot when you're building these because uh, if your assistant does something you don't expect, then you can go in and see exactly what uh, information it was calling the tools with. In this case, it was calling with, uh, uh, you can see the time ranges that it called with, you can see the UTC offset, um, and then you can see the response from the tool, which is also very helpful. Uh, so you can see these are the time slots that the tool returned. Um, and then, you know, there's the rest of the conversation. Uh, because we said we didn't like that time slot, it had to query the schedule again with different with the different ranges. You can see that. You can see its response. Um, and then also this, so the scheduling assistant didn't have a lot of data output, but, sorry, but the lead qualification did. So you can also see all of the data, uh, the data outputs that came out of your system. So uh, I can't stress enough how important this part of the app is while you're building these. Uh, you know, it's uh, building AI with prompts is usually a lot easier and I'm a lot more straightforward for non-programmers than building um, flows, workflows with branching and filters, but uh, it is still doesn't do exactly what you think it's going to do all the time. And so uh, you will end up testing and tweaking and troubleshooting. And this is the area that we're going to want to use for that. Uh, okay, time, 947. So I think, I think I can open it up to questions now. Let me just double check what I want to show. I guess there's one more quick thing I would like to, I'd like to show you guys. Um, so, uh, like, you know, every tool that gets run, or most of them anyway, are, are flows. And so, you, of course, you can use your, um, your interaction log to see that aspect of this as well. Uh, so we can see, like, for instance, here's a query schedule. We can see just like you're used to with your, when you're building other kinds of flows, you have the, the interaction log for all your tools. So you can get the specifics of what went in, what went out. Um, and then I do want to show the capture lead tool real quick. This is, you're going to want to explore this a little bit more on your own, but this is, this is the flow that ran after the assistant was complete and it updated our Google spreadsheet. 
and set the, the profile. Um, if you look in here in the information that was uh, that came into this flow, you can see there's you know quite a bit of, of stuff here that you might want to use in your flows. I'm not going to go through all of it. I'm just going to encourage you to explore this, but you should definitely take a look at all of the data that's available um, uh, in these in these events because there's there's quite a bit you can do with it. All right, uh, I am going to stop now for a minute. And, uh, and and open up to, to Q and A. All right. Uh, so the way we're gonna run the Q and A, just so we have a bit more structure. If you can, if, like, if you have a question, please raise your hand through the, well, through Zoom, like through the reactions. If you don't know how, you can, uh, you just hover over with your mouse on the black bar below. You click on reactions and then you click raise hand. And we have Ben. You can unmute yourself. All right. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, Nathan, thank you for the presentation. That was a, a very interesting one. I uh, learned a lot. Um, I'm going to try to make it short uh, to give time for others. Um, I, I run a company that serves around 100,000 people a year. Um, it's mostly travelers, uh, and we do have uh, automation that we need to do through these bots that would help us a lot. Uh, my first question is, we use a, uh, a general like inbox that where we deal with uh, the WhatsApp, that incoming WhatsApps right now. I would love to use um, Flow XO to deal with the conversation outside of that uh, inbox and then escalate escalate it to a human once it's ready to be taken by a human. So is it the same logic than, you know, uh, the system where what happens after the interaction? Is it is, is there a way to to do that, where to tell the system, hey, the conversation is over now. I need to talk to a human, right? I need to talk to someone that can go further with that. Is there a way to do that? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I, I would encourage you to look at the at the live, the video of the live training we did last week that covered that exact scenario. Okay. Um, and also I, in our assistant documentation, there's a little bit on it and we can help you in this in, um, on our support team as well. But uh, the short answer is yes, that's, that's a first class part of this, uh, of this system. In fact, um, here, the, this is the, the flow that we built in the last uh, training and it does exactly that. Um, in this case, it's like it's doing some intake to get the reasons for needing to be transferred, and then it will it will transfer to uh, to a live agent. Okay, so and we can still get the context and everything of the conversation we didn't we didn't see, right? So on our screen, we could have a context before we answer, like understanding the options that were you know uh, chosen and all these things. Yeah, you'll see the the whole conversation. Okay. All right, I'll let other, I have another questions before later. I'll let others uh, <laughs> ask their questions. All right, Ben, thank you. I'll also send you the training Nathan mentioned. Yeah, thank you. Uh, next up, Dallas. Uh, you, can, you, uh, you can unmute yourself first. Thanks, guys. Appreciate the uh, training today. Um, wanted to ask about best practices for handoff between assistants. We showed a lot of complex uh, escalations and handoffs in the last session, um, but and we also saw some handoffs today, but I didn't get a chance to really understand how that is technically done. Sure. So what level of technical are you asking about? Well, specifically, um, in my own experiments wiring th these things together, I've had I was surprised to see the chatbots reintroducing themselves, the assistants reintroducing themselves every time there's a handoff, and I think yeah. I saw today a suppression of that in your instructions, saying yes, good don't eye. introduce yourself. Yep, and that's exactly why. Okay, so that um, is so what we should do. That's what you should do. Uh, so the you want to keep the person persona very small on the on the sub assistants that are getting called by other assistants because you shouldn't have a personality. Uh, and so that's what we need here. You're a scheduling bot. Don't do not introduce yourself and that that solved that problem. Great. Thanks very much. Yep. Uh, Fabio. Yeah. Hey there. Thank you, Nathan. 
that's a great presentation. I'm kind of impressed of everything you can do now. Uh, my question is a simple one. I, I'd like to know if, is it possible to validate some fields? For example, like a zip code or a social number or something that needs validation, maybe even in the regular way I use uh, regular expressions. So is that possible in this new building way? So, uh, not in the not in the sense that you're thinking about is in that we can put our own validation logic in into the mix because the assistant's really doing all of the processing of the messages. That being said, OpenAI is pretty good at that at doing validation. So um, let me go into the output fields here. So there is a field. Oh, let me add that. So there's two different things that you that you can do for for validation. Um, let's just take email for example. All right. So there's a format field here. So if you were to be collecting a social security number, you could put you could do this. You could write SSN. And then in the description, if you if that wasn't enough, you could say um, ensure a valid social security number, and that really for most of your common use cases is going to be enough for it, for the AI to validate correctly, and it and it won't accept the bad input. Um, so I would just I would encourage you to, to experiment with that. It it may even be possible that that the AI can handle can understand a regular expression that's never tried that. I have no idea. Yeah, it's even better if you, I I don't need to write a one uh, write a uh, right. regular expression. So yeah, if I may, can I ask you another question? Sure. Uh, it, it's it's really simple as well. You mentioned before to use the word choices uh, <clears throat> to explicit call for uh, show buttons. Uh, do I have to write the instructions always in English or for that specific word? I, I have to use that specific word. Uh, what about if I'm writing a, a bot in another language? Uh, I, I would expect that OpenAI would do just fine at, at translating that, um, you know, as long as there's a, a reasonably close word in both languages, which I'm sure there is in, in most languages. Um, I, I, I'm not bilingual, so I haven't written a whole lot of prompts, any, in, in other languages. So it's going to require some trial and error. If you do try it, I'd love to know how it worked out. If you needed to use the English words or not. I, I don't think you will. All right, Carmen. Carmen, are you here? You're muted, Carmen. Yeah, sorry, I'm sorry. I, I, my, my headphones were, I couldn't I'm hear sorry. you. Okay, so um, hello, and thank you so much for the presentation, Nathan. It was awesome. Um, I have questions regarding languages as well, because my chatbot is not, like, it's not always replying in the same language my, my users are, are asking. And I'm going a bit crazy with this because I don't know how to prompt it. So... I don't know. Any ideas? Uh, I'd have to. I'd have to see uh, so, some examples. I think if if you want to, um, if you if you implemented those suggestions that we had over over the support email, and you're still having the same problem, uh, if you could send me an example, I will. I'll take a. I'll take a look at yeah. it. Sorry, I'm a little bit of a pain in the neck. I'm, I've been bothering. No, no, not not at, not at all. I mean, this is something we, we this is something we'd really like to to find the best practices for, because I'm sure it's a very common uh, common yeah. scenario. But there's 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 a number of different things that that could be going on, and I'm I'm 100 sure there's a fix, but but they're probably a little bit uh, use case like individual to the okay, to the I'll, assistant. I'll I'll send them to you because I I tried connected uh, I tried connecting ChatGPT four today 
And it's true, it, it works so much better, but it's expensive. <laughs> so I'm gonna go back to 3.5 and and try to prompt it better, or I don't know. Oh, so it, 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 it was working in four. Yes, in four, it was awesome. It was perfect. It was like okay. having a real person there, but I can't afford it, so. Um, okay, yeah, so so send it to me. I'll, I'll see, we'll see if we can find a way to make 3.5 play ball. Um, it's really an inferior model. Uh, so yeah. we'll, 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 we'll see what we can, what we can do to make it more consistent, but there's a, there's a possibility that, that it's just going to make mistakes sometimes. Yeah. Okay. And just some, some tiny feedback from like when I'm, when I'm, when I'm seeing the logs, uh, like the conversation with the chatbot with the assistant and the user, when it triggers a, when it calls a, a tool, it always it always says no content in the log, and I can't really see the conversation, and it's a little bit annoying because you have to switch between the the um, the user full conversation and the and the assist, the assistant log. I don't know if I'm being clear enough here. So it would be great um, if instead of no content, it would show the actual message. So, okay. Um, yeah, can you can you send me a a link to the to your to a run log that has that, and I'll 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 see if I can puzzle like, what you what you're saying. I, I I think I know what you mean, but it'd be better mm -hmm. if I had an example. So okay. it just not not right now, but just in an email when you send me the um the link to your yeah. language problem. It's Okay. It says no content, and it would be very helpful to see what what happened there, instead of just switch. And that's it. Sure. Thank you. Uh, okay. Thanks, Carmen. All right. Uh, I think probably. Oh, there's three hands up. Oh, uh, so Ben was first, and then Dallas, okay. and Carmen. Right, just, uh, I think she has a lower hand. Thank you, guys. Um, Nathan, I'm going to the level of personalization that you can uh, achieve with that. Um, our use case is for each of the travelers that we have, we have a lot of attributes about them, like where they are, where they're staying that night and where they're going to stay tomorrow. And we have all this in forms of PDFs that somehow we can, you know, uh, get a more structured information about each traveler. Uh, is it something that can be handled through uh, Flow Exo? Is it, is it where we could put a lot of information on one uh, user and have the bots tap into it to answer questions for the client, like very specific questions and taking consideration where they're going to be staying and which hotel they're talking about. Uh, is it, can we add documents or can we add a lot of information per user? That's pretty much my, my question. Uh, so I'll have to think about that. Are the, um, are the documents on the internet? That's something on our platform. Uh, that you know the travel agents pretty much share with us. Uh, so for each traveler or party that travels, we have so many information. We have the complete itinerary of where they're going, where they're going to be at, uh, what they're going to be doing, which activity. So basically, my I would love to somehow try to upload that information under a profile, and the bot is going to tap into that information to answer the questions. So it's almost like an ass one assistant per traveler, <laughs> uh, and I'm not sure how to. Uh, to hand tangle this type of uh, challenge here. Yeah. Um, do you can you can you send that scenario uh, to support at flowxo.com? And I don't have an immediate answer for you, so I haven't thought that through. So you can definitely upload all your PDFs to a knowledge base, but that's not a that's not on a per user basis. They're probably uh, and, and I'd have to understand more about your workflow. Like, is a human being uploading these? To yeah. for each specific yeah. user, they are okay. Yeah. 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 Um, I, I need to think a little bit about that. I'm sure there's a solution to that, but it's not off the tip of my tongue. Sure. All right. Uh, last quick one. WhatsApp is does all of this works very well with WhatsApp as well? If there's any kind of restrictions because of Facebook and the buttons they put in there, or yeah, uh, WhatsApp does have some some buttons like the number of buttons. You can only have three choices. Okay. Uh, on a on a card, but if but you know they have another interface which is a list, and so we'll we'll default to that. That can have like nine, I think, or eleven choices or something like that. 
So okay. if you're building for WhatsApp, you do have to do a little bit more trial and error and maybe add some rules to your instructions mm -hmm. to like limit the number of choices if you if you have a lot of them. Other than that, it's it can it doesn't really have a whole lot of restriction. Okay. Thank you, Nathan. No uh, real quick, Ben, are you from OnSpot? Yes. Okay, I'm sending you an email now with the escalation agent. Thank you so much. Uh, Dallas? I know we're at time here, so this will be real quick. It has to do with the um, any guidance you have on the syntax or meta descriptions in the instructions field. So you, you told us last week, Nathan, that uh, markdown is your recommended way of uh, hierarchy here, uh, of, of indicating hierarchy. Uh, I'm wondering if you've learned anything over the last week about how to use numbers versus bullets and, and structuring things best for um, for uh, open AI on the back end, if you want a process that is followed. Yeah. Um, so the short answer is no, I haven't learned anything new in the last week, but I'm constantly learning. So we're going to do probably not next week, but in a, in a week or two, we're going to do a training on that exact topic on best practices for writing, um, for writing prompts. Uh, I don't know yet, which is better, whether or not it's numbers, whether or not it's bullets and indentation. So um, that's something we're actively doing R and D on to, to, to really figure out which one works best. So we'll be sharing that soon, but I don't, right now, it's, you just gotta try, see which one works best for you. That's what I've been doing. And and Dallas, if you have, if, if you're having trouble getting it to follow your processes, um, always happy to, to take a look at your prompt and we see uh, if we can help, yeah. Thanks. No problem. All right, All right Carmen, or? Do we do we have time for a bit? Hi, time? sorry again. I'll be very quick. <laughs> so uh, my knowledge base is uh, my whole knowledge base, the one that is public online. And I want to exclude a couple of URLs from it because it's giving confusing information about some of my services that are not that relevant. Can I do that? You can. Um, there's two different ways you can do it. You can do it when you're uh you can do it when you set your knowledge base up mm -hmm. uh by if so when you do your website if you go into advanced you can uh, put the urls you don't want here okay. and it won't it won't read those urls and then once if your knowledge base is already loaded and you want to uh you want to turn some off mm -hmm. you can always click turn the published off on the ones you don't want Oh, perfect. Okay, that was easy. Thank you. Yep. All right, so that's time. Uh, thank you guys very, very much for showing up. Um, reach you. out to us on our support channel. If, if you have any trouble with this, if you have questions about pre best practices, we're, we're ready to assist in any way we can. Thanks a lot. Have a great rest of your day, guys. Thank you, guys. See you. Bye.